Now programming from the Illinois Channel, an independent nonpartisan corporation formed to provide nonpartisan coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. For more information on the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org. Just ahead, we talked to Dr. Brent Clark, the Executive Director for the Illinois Association of School Administrators, as we ask him how administrators are operating without a school funding formula. We also get his thoughts on the governor's mandatory veto of the recent school finance bill. Then in about 20 minutes, Republican State Senator Jason Berrickman and House Representative Bob Pritchard are joined by Democrats State Senator Andy Menar and House Representative Will Davis as they discuss the ongoing debate over school funding. Following that, in about one hour and ten minutes, Governor Rauner speaks at the Republican Day rally at the State Fair. And finally, in about one hour and 25 minutes, several Democrat candidates for governor, including State Senator Daniel Biss and businessman J.B. Pritzker, discuss their platform and why they're running. That's all just ahead, after a brief word from one of our advisory council members. Illinois Channel salutes our advisory council members, leaders in business, education, law, medicine, and other fields from across Illinois. Hi, I'm Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. Education has never been more challenging in Illinois than it is right now. With comprehensive education reform recently passed by lawmakers and our state's financing of education remaining under pressure. That's why the Illinois Principals Association acts to represent the needs of students and our members. We keep our principals up to date on changes in the law affecting education policy, and we advocate to keep our schools safe and to maintain a healthy environment conducive to learning. With all the changes happening in every field and with the ongoing financial problems facing Illinois, it's vital we all know about changes affecting our lives. That's why the Illinois Principals Association is proud to be a part of the Illinois Channel's advisory on education. Their coverage, whether that of key lawmakers discussing changes in education, an interview with the Illinois Budget Director on the state's finances, or the one-on-one -on -one interviews with those working in education, all help to keep citizens across the state connected to the real issues that impact the education of our children. I'm Jason Leahy, Executive Director of the Illinois Principals Association. I'm also proud to say I serve on the Illinois Channel's Advisory Council. The Illinois Channel, it works for all of us. Next, from Springfield, we talk to Dr. Brent Clark, the Executive Director for the Illinois Association of School Administrators, as we ask him how administrators are operating without a school funding formula. We also get his thoughts on the governor's mandatory veto of the recent school finance bill. This runs about 20 minutes. Dr. Brent Clark, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. and. As we stand here, the legislature, which I think everyone who follows politics would understand, we're having this another battle. We got rid of the budget, but now it's a question of funding education on the question of SB1, Senate Bill 1, which is a uh, funding formula for the state. It was passed by the legislature. It was vetoed by the governor, and at this point, the Senate has overridden that veto. Right. But school schools are opening. We still don't have a funding formula. Right. As, as the Association of School Administrators, how are administrators dealing with, in this environment where you don't even know what your funding is going to be? It is, uh, it is indescribable. There's no uh, history pattern that we have to look back on and follow. Uh, we, we've gone back as far as the Great Depression to fight, try to figure out what they did then, and we found some school districts were paying teachers with wooden nickels. And uh, I can't imagine uh, using the wooden nickel program today in this economy in 2017. It's just unprecedented where we're at. Do you have a count on the, as you look across the state, uh, I mean, so school districts are going to be in all kinds of different financial situations. Some can go the whole year without uh, uh, finances, but you know, how many are really in yeah, critical you know, short-term financial the, the buying? The very picture of those that can go the whole year versus those that are literally figuring out here how many days they can stay open is indicative of the school funding formula we've been operating under. It's, it's, it's what's driven the difference between the haves and the haves nots, between those that have equity, those that are far below equity and adequacy. 
Uh, it's, the, it's the picture, if you will, that the current formula has delivered to Illinois, where you've got 80% of your districts far below what they adequately need. So uh, school administrators are trying to figure out uh, days of cash on hand. They're trying to figure out how many dollars are they spending every day, how many, how many days does that translate into, can they borrow from the local bank on a line of credit, uh, when does their tax money come in to them so they can have that at least to spend and burn days, build uh, buy days, if you will, to, for the school year. But at some point, many of them are going to run out of that local cash. We've got districts that are, that are in the September range. I've got one that's much closer than that. Uh, they're, they're concerned if they can get through the end of August. So we've got a couple that are really early in the, in the process of, of how far they can go, and certainly a bunch that, that are uh, in trouble in late September. When, when we go through the back and forth, and there's been a lot of politics on this whole thing on both sides, and I'll say for the audience, you're a nonpartisan organization. So we are, when you, absolutely. When you yeah. cite certain things, you're not being critical uh, from a political standpoint, but from your standpoint of being a school administrator and what you think works and not. What, it, without getting into the weeds too much on the back and forth political arguments, the governor, uh, just to make clear to people, after the bill was passed, the governor made an amendatory veto, which meant that he change some of the language of the bill and then the legislature can either accept it or reject it. The Senate rejected it already. From the changes the governor made, what is your reaction and as, as one who's been deeply involved in educational issues over the years? Well, the bill was 463 pages roughly and by my count there were 102 changes that he made to that bill and he, he eviscerated uh, the heart, the intention and the protections that were put into that bill to, to refurbish uh, the schools over the long term. I heard one person, one analyst uh, say, you know, the AV is uh, akin to a shot of Red Bull to a starving man, and the SB1 was a long-term nutritional uh, program. And it really did go in and, and try to uh, distract people with inflated numbers in the first year to get them to take that bait, if you will, and, there, and forego then all of the benefits and safeguards guardrails, if you will, that we built into the system to really bring schools back that have been so poorly deteriorated financially over, over the last 20 years in Illinois. So when the governor is going out and giving his speeches that he has been giving, he will cite that Springfield will get so much more money, this district will get so much more money, and, mm -hmm. and you, but you're saying that's a short-term fix. It is. In, in outer years, that's not going to be there. It is, absolutely. I mean, if the old saying is, if you if you rob Peter to pay Paul, then it's not hard to difficult hard to figure out that Paul's going to get more as a result of Peter losing, and that's exactly what's happening in the amendatory veto. You're taking money from one set of children and giving it to another set of children, of, of essentially pitting one child against another child. That's just bad public policy for a state uh, like Illinois, and uh, we're a huge diverse state. We ought to recognize that and step away from the divisiveness. Uh, that, that's been perpetrated and try to come together around something that really does build our schools in a, in a classy way going forward. And again, I'm not saying, I'm just going to be saying what Speaker Madigan said yesterday, not to be defending or opposing what he's saying, but Mad as Speaker Madigan said they're going to take an override vote uh, next Wednesday, the 23rd of August, that uh, I think his words were, we are not going to walk away from SB1 and that this has taken years of work. It's a, the SB1 was a reflection of years of work. How is SB1, which does change the funding formula, you touched on that earlier on, how does it change it? And I know you can't go into all the different ways, but how is it overall a, a better formula than what we had? And if we could, let's then also touch on some of the things the amendatory veto did, and were there any good parts in the amendatory veto, or or just some negative. I, I would say that uh, at the highest levels, what does SB1 do and what's the change effectively do is it causes the state of Illinois to send its money to the districts that need it the most. We do not have that today. We're still st sending money to districts that don't necessarily need it. They have an adequate amount on hand to educate their kids. In today's formula, SB1 changes that and it says state money goes to the kids that need it the most. That's the, that's the change. Now, it takes a lot to make that happen mechanically and mathematically, but that's the change. And then to the point about the AV, 
there, there, were, uh, there were a lot of things taken out that were built in on purpose. So I've, I've got a list here. I, I cannot sure. recall all of these without looking at a list. But it, it eliminated what we call an annual recalibration of the adequacy target, which simply means this. Over the course of time, it's normal that your cost of doing business when you're running a school, you're employing people, uh, you're buying products, your cost of business is going to creep up, upward. This SB1 recognizes that. The governor's amendatory veto eliminates that annual recalibration. He called that a cost saver. Well, yes, if you hang today's cost and we're 10 years down the road and we're still hanging on today's cost, of course it would be a cost saver, but it's also inaccurate and it's unfair to school districts to be pegged with a number that's ancient, like we have today. Second thing is it it uh, deleted what we call a proration protection. So for the last eight years, districts have been subjected to a, a discounted amount of state aid coming to them. We'll promise you X, but we'll give you 90% of X. So that's pro, they call it proration, which is a really smooth word for we're cutting your funding. So we had proration protections built in for the districts that could least afford to be prorated. So that's all removed from the bill. Uh, it created a hold harmless on a per pupil basis instead of a hold harmless on a district wide basis. Now there's clearly an argument to be made there on his in, in the governor's defense about not sending money to follow ghost students. But the counter to that is that if you went to the hold harmless per pupil, you would effectively be reducing contributions, state contributions, to districts that we have determined to be below their adequate amount. The deal, if you will, the hybrid ground there, the middle ground, would be to simply say, leave people in a district-wide hold harmless until they reach adequacy, then switch to per pupil. That way you're insured that you're not spending any more dollars than necessary to any school district. That's the way to deal with that, his opinion and SB1's opinion. There's middle ground on that item. The fourth thing that it changed, big item, would be, again, 102 changes, but these are the big, big categories. The fourth major category was what we call a pension cost shift change, and that is an, uh, what's, what's called Tier 3. Uh, tier 3 teachers will be coming into our system soon, and all of the pension cost, all the retirement cost, if you will, for those Tier 3 te teachers will be the responsibility of each local school district. Today, under the base system, the state is a partner in paying a portion of the cost for teacher pensions. Certainly local teachers and school districts pay a portion and the state pays a portion. But in going forward, under tier three, all new teachers will be the sole responsibility of a local school district. The state of Illinois will be getting out of the pension business. He removed that pension protection for the school districts in his mandatory veto. That's a major financial piece, not in the first year. But as you go out, that compounded effect financially really becomes a big deal. And, I, and if I might insert there, it would seem to me that then that would drive up local property taxes. Without question. Which, which is exactly what he says he's trying to cut. Right? Without question, it will drive up local costs, which you have, to, you have to gain those monies from somewhere. Right. And the only place we've been able to get that is local property taxes. And by the way, for the record, superintendents do not like to raise local property taxes. If SB1 is implemented over a, long over a long term with fidelity, there is a path forward where superintendents could lower, in conjunction with their community, lower uh, the tax burden that they've had to levy uh, locally in so many places. The fifth thing, fifth major area, is it erased what we call the minimum funding level. Because we've got experience in dealing with the General Assembly, we built into the law that in, in future years, there's a minimum funding level that the General Assembly would have to put in to the formula. You couldn't just get by with giving us 90% of X or 88% of X or 91% of X. You'd have to put a minimum funding into the formula so schools could count on their, their revenues for the next year. We, we're required by law to make personnel decisions in March and April. We, we hardly have ever been given a budget before May 31st, and now the last two or three years it's drug out into the summer. Here we are, August the 17th, still wondering what it's going to be. So we put in a minimum funding level and said, we're going to, we're going to help these districts be able to plan for programs and people uh, at the right times of the year and not be hung literally the week school starting, still wondering what the budget's going to look like. So that was in our SB1. That was removed in the amendatory veto. A big underlying principle, the next item on the list, a big underlying principle was this idea that no district could lose money. We've seen efforts 
to pass school funding reform where we took from one district and gave to another. Those have failed. Those have failed because the public policy just didn't pass the smell test. Well, SB1 says no district loses dollars. Everyone starts at least where they, where they, where they the beginning point, if you will. They're held harmless at that point. And in, in the amendatory veto, I believe there were 26 districts, I believe, that lost money under the amendatory veto. That's a no-go for us. That creates what we call red numbers. You'll hear us talk about no red numbers. And red numbers mean that their, their budget is going down. 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 Their, their revenues from the state of Illinois is going down. And by the way, let me, for the people who don't need the terminology, hold harmless, would say to a school district, whatever your funding was, you're not going to get less than that. That's correct, in terms of state funding. Right. Doesn't, that doesn't impact local money or federal money, that's just state money. We're trying to hold that in a status position if you're, if you're losing enrollment. And SB1 holds, has a hold harmless, but is it just a one-year hold harmless? No, it is okay. not. It's a perpetual hold harmless, knowing that as we move districts upward and toward adequacy, then that hold harmless provision becomes less and less important uh, because we're moving them, advancing them, if you will, on a per-pupil basis toward their adequacy targets. So hold harmless over time then sort of takes care of itself. The next item is, uh, that was in the amendatory veto that bothered us greatly was the capping of regionalization costs. I think most people recognize in Illinois, it just costs more money to live in the suburbs in Cook County. And we recognized that in SB1 and we, we gave them some credit for that when we calculated their adequacy targets. The amendatory veto reduced that by a 2%, which would effectively mean they're going to get a false adequacy target and they're going to have to raise more money locally, again going back to raising more property taxes to reach what they really need or raise what they really need for adequate targets. So um, that was a problem. It affected 313 school districts. And then finally, the most bizarre part of the amendatory veto was this, this piece where we had to artificially count the wealth that existed inside TIF districts, which are known as TIF tax in increment financing dis districts. They're uh, used for economic development by counties and cities and municipalities. And count the artificial wealth that's, that's suppressed in PTEL counties, which are property tax extension limitation laws. Those two laws, TIF and PTEL, are by design uh, crafted so that school districts cannot reach in there, tax that, and, and access that money out and spend it in their school. That PTEL is simply suppressed. You cannot access it. It stays with the taxpayer. TIF, the money is not accessible by the school, but it's accessible by the municipality for redevelopment of blighted areas and building roads and refurbishing buildings and trying you may, to you may have a building, uh, drive economic development. Yeah, a community, let's say uh, yeah. Peoria, has redeveloped right. their business riverfront. They, now they have all kinds of businesses. Uh, but they would have used maybe a TIF money to have that going. No question. And that's all over Illinois. Okay. I think it affected 574 school districts, just the TIF and the PTEL piece. And that, that was just really bizarre because it was going to artificially inflate the adequacy amount that a school district allegedly had when there's, by law, prohibited their prohibition from going and getting that money to spend it. I know it, it's easy for people who don't deal with these issues to get lost, so I'm just going to restate it. If you had, as an example, $100 million dollars, of property value in a TIF district, the school district cannot tax that $100 million. The governor That's saying, correct. we want you to count that $100 million because you're the guys that are taking the $100 million of property off, off the books for your school district. But he was incorrect in that regard. School districts do not create, generate, or manage TIF districts. Those are generally run by counties, cities, and municipalities. School districts have a history of wanting to work with their local mayors or local county chairman to try to help with economic development. I think that's an underlying uh, issue for all of us, trying to help our state grow. School districts are certainly a partner in that, and they've not been obstinate to it. They've been rather cooperative. So now to come along and punish them for that cooperative nature and economic development would be incredibly unfair. And uh, mathematically, just, just, the, just the math just doesn't add up. So it's just really a bizarre piece of that. Now, is there an issue there that needs looked into about how those are managed? Probably so, but it's, it's, it's kind of its own separate issue that needs dealt with, not thrown into uh, the final days and hours of, of a school funding formula. Yeah, too, too big of an issue to work out. It really is. It really right is at this point. School, yes, right? absolutely. It really is. Speaker Madigan, in his press conference, uh, said he was willing to compromise on the governor and have some discussions, although he was doubtful 
in his estimation, if the governor was wanting a compromise. Are there any talks going on that you and other education associations are dealing with at this point? And if so, are they promising or is it kind of more of a going nowhere? I would say this, uh, throughout June and some of July, there were many talks and we served as a technical advisor to both, both parties, giving them both the same information so that they, as they negotiated with one another, and at least in what we were providing, they were working off of factual pieces. Uh, we certainly weren't party to that. Uh, that was strictly held between the caucuses themselves. I think they tried. I just don't think they could get to an agreement. Uh, I'm not sure what totally held that up. I've got my own assumptions, but that's personal. That's an opinion and not a fact, so I won't state that here. I do know the leaders of all four caucuses, uh, Leader Designee Brady, uh, Senate President Cullerton, Speaker Madigan, and Leader Durkin are scheduled to meet tomorrow in Chicago to see if they can iron out the final pieces and differences, if you will, to bring this to final resolution. I, I don't know if they'll get it done or not. I really don't. I, what I saw uh, back in July when we were trying to finalize the budget and revenue uh, was actual legislators uh, working amongst themselves to kind of get it worked out. And uh, it will not surprise me if that's how this ends up again, is the legislators themselves, outside of the leaders, actually working it out. Dr. Brian Clark, it's been very involved. We appreciate you giving us the details. I yes. think that was undercovered yes. on the mandatory veto. Yeah. And uh, good luck to you and the schools, and hopefully we have this resolved soon. I hope so. I mean, uh, I don't know of another state that's in this position with schools starting and no funding in, in line. I mean, it's, it's un, unfortunate. Our parents have to be confused. I mean, imagine. Uh, we're, we're real close to the fire here, so we get it. But imagine being a parent two or three hours from Springfield. You've got to be shaking your head at this town. I mean, we've got a budget finally, we've got revenue finally, but now we can't figure out how to move it from Springfield to your school. That is just, it's almost a comedy show, and, and uh, except it's not, it's sad. Uh, so uh, for the hopes of the kids and the parents and, and our teachers, certainly our school administrators, we hope we get it resolved. Thanks so much. You bet. Next, from Chicago, Republican State Senator Jason Berrickman and House Representative Bob Pritchard are joined by Democrat State Senator Andy Menar and House Representative Will Davis as they discuss the ongoing debate over school funding. This runs about 50 minutes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me on this really impeccably timed conversation. Wow, it could have been disaster, <laughs> but instead we are, of course, right at a very crucial moment for education funding in the state of Illinois, obviously on Sunday, because I don't know, the General Assembly cannot stop itself from ruining everybody's weekends. Um, took a vote on what has really been, come to be known as Senate Bill 1 in a way that I think not a lot of legislation actually, you, you never know the bill number. And when it comes to this education funding formula, Senate Bill 1 definitely has um, gone against that. And so the Senate, of course, as I'm sure you all well know, uh, went ahead and overrode Governor Bruce Rauner's fairly sweeping veto of legislation that passed with mostly Democratic votes only in the spring and then of course was held on to for a couple of months, which is partially why we are here at this moment as school. I, I think some districts begin in just a matter of days, even I think one tomorrow for Elgin if I'm correct heading underway, not knowing when they will get their general state aid payments from Illinois government. It is under that umbrella that I will leave it to our panelists to discuss. And because I am a woman who likes organization and in honor of school teachers who taught me my ABCs at a wee age, let's go in alphabetical order here, beginning with Senator Jason Berkman. So, uh, uh, Thank you, Amanda, and uh, to the City Club as well for, for hosting this great event. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see many of our uh, legislative colleagues uh, in the audience, and of course, to serve on this panel with uh, three other individuals who, uh, like myself, have spent uh, years of their lives on this issue. 
and um, I have the utmost respect for, for each of the three here. You know, as, as I think we often joke, if it were as simple as getting four people to come to an agreement, uh, this, this issue would be solved long ago. Uh, we live in a democracy, and certainly on this issue, this has been a very challenging one for us to solve. I thought that it would be important for me to outline briefly some, some of the brief kind of historical moments of this school funding debate and then hone in on some of the facts that I think are important to, uh, to frame for today's discussion. So for many years, many of us have been critical of the way in which the state of Illinois distributes its money. Uh, I often joke that I'm here today on this panel because some four or five years ago, I raised my hand in caucus and said, hey, I'd be willing to help try to solve this issue. Now, over the years, there's been rhetoric on both sides. You heard maybe a year or two ago the voices that said this is about parity, that we need parity in the way in which we fund our schools. And of course, then some defined parity to mean the fact that uh, CPS needed to have its pensions paid. You heard Republicans talk about the fact that CPS has some benefits under the law today that, that are not extended to other school districts. But there's this discussion about parity. We spent the spring on the Governor's Reform Commission. I was proud to be a member of that, as were my colleagues here. That reform, that commission uh, produced a very good blueprint, a work product that the legislature could work from. It's important to recognize that that work product included agreements that the commissioners made, like the fact that we were not going to address pensions within the school funding formula that as Republicans, we have said we would like to have input and a debate from Democrats on pension reform, but we all agreed for the commission rewriting the school funding formula, pensions was a side issue that ought best be dealt with um, outside that commission. We agreed to that. We also agreed to other things like the fact that we'd use an evidence-based funding model and that we'd utilize what's called a hold harmless on a per pupil, not a per district level. Now, in the spring, we in engaged in negotiations over the actual legislation. Senate Bill 1 was a product of that. And in fact, Republicans and Democrats were meeting regularly to negotiate the language included in SB 1. Late in May, specifically May 29th, at the end of the legislative cycle, amendments were added to SB 1 that did things that really changed the discussion. And as Republicans, we felt represented Democrats moving away from the negotiations and more in line with their priorities. That included amendments to Senate Bill 1 to allow for the state to pay Chicago's pension costs, health care costs, legacy pension costs. A number of issues that were not part of our negotiations suddenly became included in the legislation. Of course, the Democrats passed Senate Bill 1 on generally a Democrat vote and then held it for months, creating this unnecessary crisis around our state. More recently, the governor utilized his amendatory veto like many others in the room. I read that for the first time when it was issued. And within that amendatory veto are some important policy issues that I think we negotiators and legislators will consider. But here's the thing that I think we need to focus on for today's discussion, which is not the rhetoric of what it is we're trying to do and why. I think we all believe we need to have a formula that's fixed, that's fair, that works for all 852 of our school districts, that removes the inequities that exist within the broken school funding formula today. But the facts that legislators are tussling with are these. Today, the state of Illinois does not pay Chicago's pension costs. I know that there are some people in the state who believe that the state should pay those costs. As a fact, the state does not today. The cost of those, the normal pension cost today, $165 million. I don't think there's a dispute over that. Senate Bill 1 proposes to change the existing law so that the state pays this normal pension cost. It also proposes that the state pay CPS's health care costs by embedding the value of that in the formula and its legacy costs by adjusting the formula to offset those legacy costs. All facts. Today, Chicago has a block grant. A block grant is essentially a set-aside or a subsidy. It's valued at $250 million. The law today says that Chicago gets this benefit. Senate Bill 1 says we're going to take that benefit and we're going to put it right in the formula. We're not going to get rid of it. We're going to keep it. Also today, under the law, 
Chicago gets the, the ability to control some of its personnel costs through a just through the law that favors Chicago, that same law does not benefit 851 other school districts. As part of our negotiations, Republicans and myself have said, why don't we extend the benefits given to Chicago? We don't want to take that away. We want to extend the benefits that Chicago has to control its costs to other school districts. We get a resounding no from Democrats on this issue. They want to change the law to pay Chicago's pensions. They want to retain the $200, $250 million block grant, but they're unwilling to change the law to extend benefits that Chicago has to every other school district. And so I'll conclude. I'll conclude here. <laughs> I, I heard the, the, <laughs> the sigh. <laughs> We, we want to fix the formula. It's imperative that we fix the formula. But what has been drawn, the line that's been drawn in the sand by Democrats, I believe, is one that's impossible for us to solve. They have said, as part of fixing school funding, we all agree it needs to be an evidence-based model, but they have said the state must pay Chicago's pensions. Now, some said, pull that out, we could get an agreement. Democrats have said it's a must-have. You got to pay the pensions in order to fix the formula. So Republicans have said, okay, let's negotiate it. What are you willing to trade in order to negotiate that? Will you extend the rights that Chicago has to control its costs to other school districts? The answer is no. This creates an impossible situation that must be overcome if we're to resolve this matter in the, in the, the way that it should, a bipartisan agreement, and in the time that it should, which is now. So with that, thank you. And I, I do think I a bit buried the lead here. Part of why this is such a wonderful panel for this point in time is because these are four of the eight negotiators that have been designated to negotiate by their leadership some sort of education compromise. There are also, of course, a call from the governor yesterday for legislative leaders to do the same. But really, these are half of the pros that are going to be making these decisions and parsing out all of the details. So without further ado, the uh, next of those individuals, Representative Will Davis, the sponsor in the Illinois House of Senate Bill 1. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, an honor and a pleasure to, uh, to be here with you today. Um, as I listen uh, to, my, to my colleague, and I don't know how much sparring you want us to do up here. Um, Lots. <laughs> um, um, he talked about the history. Okay, well, let's, let's start there. The history is that Illinois is last. That's the history, is that we have the most disparate system between state and local funding. Anybody concerned about their property taxes? Okay. Part of the reason your property taxes are where they are is because the state has abdicated its responsibility in terms of paying schools, in terms of paying uh, what its, its fair share uh, of school funding. Um, if I can relatively quote the, uh, my leader, Camille Lilly, who is the House Chair of the Black Caucus, she has consistently said that before we do anything else, we should put education first. That's primarily the first thing is that we should put education first. So relative to some of the things that the, uh, the, the senator said as he talked about the recalcitrant of Democrats, I think Andy and I can probably talk about the recalcitrant of Republicans in this as well. Some things that they have brought into the negotiation that weren't a part of SB1 that they've brought into the conversation and are expecting some kind of compromise on in order to try to get it done. Um, particularly as we have worked into the formula uh, provisions for the city of Chicago as well as supporting all of the school districts. No school district loses under SB1. Every school district gains. Now the governor has indicated that districts gain more based on the changes that he's made. Well sure, if you take money away from one school district and give it to everybody else, guess what? Everybody wins. Everybody gets more money. But it's, it's happening at the expense of one other school district. And, and I don't, wanna, don't want to, um, to, to not talk about that school district. It's the largest school district in the state. It educates the most number of low-income uh, uh, children, the most number of special education children, the most number of, of bilingual children. We cannot not deal with the city of Chicago in this conversation. So to the extent in which we attempt to do that, we didn't do it at the expense of any other district. Whereas the amendatory veto, which I assume we'll talk about, does do things at the expense of every other district. And it's important to, to, to recognize that. 
Uh, the senator talked about the governor's commission that I was a part of and how we walked through several things. And again, if, if you want to be fair, yes, we did do other things that weren't a part of the blueprint. Um, but we did a lot of other things that weren't a part of the blueprint as well. Um, but the blueprint is not concrete. As we walked forward after the governor's commission, we realized that there was a need to do other things. And SB1 is the reflection of all the other things that we felt that we needed to, to do to try to make schools better. The evidence-based model, everybody, uh, some people agree, some people have criticized it, but it's a different way of doing things. And, and unfortunately, in Illinois, the way we have been doing it just did not work. And it was a need to make a complete change and do it completely different. So the evidence-based model is a step in the direction of doing funding uh, a lot differently, or at least the way we distribute money a lot differently. But it needed to have support. It needed to have the additional support. So we're proud that in the budget that we passed, that unfortunately none of the Republicans supported, we did put an additional $350 million in for schools because we needed to, we needed to, to guarantee that if we're going to introduce a new model, that model had to have substantial financial support in order to work. So yes, there were a lot of things that we did that weren't necessarily a part of the governor's discussion, but that was just a discussion. And it talked about, it took us down the pathway toward implementing an evidence-based model. So we have an evidence-based model, and there were additional things added to it. So we walked through it. Of course, unfortunately, we got absolutely no Republican support for the evidence-based model. We passed it out of both chambers. The governors vetoed it, or and mandatorily vetoed it. But unless somebody tells me something different, Every district in the state of Illinois gets hurt by the amendatory changes, and that should not be our job. Our job should not be trying to hurt other districts, or for that matter, to pit districts against one another. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be our job. We should be moving down a path where we're supporting all districts. We're supporting all kids in the state of Illinois, because I think what we do desire is for every child to have a quality education here in the state of Illinois. That is our job as legislators, and I think that's what all of you as our constituents would want to see happen. And SB1 moves us in the right direction toward doing that. But I think it's clear that the amendatory veto the governor issued simply does not do that. Again, he's taking dollars away and saying to districts, you gain more, but at the expense of another district. Most, of, most, if not all, of the education professionals that I've talked to have no interest in hurting another district so that they gain. And that's the situation that we're in right now. We are making an appeal to our Republican colleagues. Why would you want to support something that hurts children, that hurts districts? And that's exactly what this amendatory veto does. I don't think anybody can argue with that. Bring me a superintendent, have them sit up here, and they will tell you how the amendatory veto hurts them in the manner in which it does hurt them. It makes them account for money that they don't have. TIF money is money that they don't have. They can't see it. So why are we suggesting that they have to account for that money when they can't actually spend it? It's and not dollars that they can put into their conversation. Okay, I'm sorry, Amanda. Oh, got, it's okay. Got a little carried away, too. But nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, um, we felt that it was the right way to go, the right direction to go, and we still feel that it is indeed the right way to go. And as these negotiations continue with things that are a part of SB1, and for that matter, things that weren't a part of SB1, I know ultimately we will get there. And now for his five minutes to explain the take. <laughs> because <laughs> I know, just drum down your past, what, five years into five minutes, please. Senator Andy Menar. I can do that. So I'm going to be less than five minutes. Um, first of all, thank you uh, to the City Club. This is my third conversation about school funding uh, before this organization. I hope it's my last on this topic. I hope we get it done. I think we can get it done. Um, I want to compliment uh, the three gentlemen that are sitting up here on this panel. I take them at their word when they sit at a, nego at a negotiating table, uh, that they appear in good faith and that they want to solve the problem. I think they've shown that time and again over the course of any number of years uh, since we began this recent effort to re uh, reform school funding in the state. Um, I'm only going to concentrate on the past uh, for one date, and that date is May 31st. And uh, something happened on May 31st that hadn't happened in 20 years, and that is this. A school funding reform bill withstood the test of the legislature, and it was passed by both the House and the Senate, <clears throat> first time in 20 years. So I want to begin by complimenting every legislator in this room 
who took the brave vote to pass Senate Bill 1. I thank you for doing that. that that's all I'm going to say about the past. We can go back and forth on the issues of Senate Bill 1, I guess, during questions. Um, I want to focus my remaining minute or so on urgency. Uh, my kids start school tomorrow. They're going to walk through the doors of a school building that I went to that's 58% funded at what it should be today by any calculation. Uh, that's immoral. It's cruel. It's happening everywhere in the state, not just to white children in small towns downstate, but to children all over the state here in the city of Chicago and in suburban communities. That's a fact. And as we sit here and eat lunch, that rotten system is rotting as we sit here today. This calls for decisive action, not just for uh, the school year that's beginning today and tomorrow throughout the state and then later for other districts. Um, it calls for decisive action because we've been at this now for a very long time. I had a call yesterday from Senator Berman, who um, knows the right moments to call me. And he said this to me, and I said this uh, during the Senate debate uh, on the override vote. I think it's imperative that we recognize that this moment can't go by us this time. It cannot go by us this time. And that's what Senator Berman's uh, remarks were me, to me yesterday on the phone. He said, don't let this moment go by this time. You guys can fix it. Don't let the moment go by. So I'm going to end by making an appeal to everybody in this room. Uh, we have a uh, immediate urgency to fix the problem because of school and school year starting now. But we have a historic urgency that is a stain on our state by any metric that is within reach to solve once and for all. And it's our job to get it done. And last, but of course not least, we have Representative Rob Pritchard. Thank you, Amanda, and good afternoon to all of you. And I want to thank all of you, and especially some of you that have been working on this issue for the past decade or longer to bring it to really to the focus that we have today and to try to change how we're funding education in Illinois. Andy talked a little bit about history. I'll go back to 1970 when we passed a constitution that said the state should pay a majority share of the education costs. We did, I think, for the first year or two after that, Senator Brady, but after that we lagged well behind. And after college, when I came back to Illinois for our family business, I joined an effort called Changing How Illinois Education is Funded, Chief. That was back in the early 70s, right after we passed the Constitution. And we've been working for that length of time to really get the state to pony up to the cost that it has for the most important service it provides, and that's for the future of every young individual in our state. So it's been a long fight, and it's taken the efforts of many of you to bring us where we are today. And I think as our Governor's Commission met last year, there was very quick consensus that A, we needed to change the funding formula, but B, that the evidence-based model was a model that deserved to be implemented in Illinois and provide our school districts with what I call a toolbox of resources to provide for the needs of every student in their district. And that's one of the things that I think the evidence-based model brings for us is the fact that we can determine the cost of education, the adequacy target for every school district. And taxpayers that say they're paying too much can look at that adequacy target and see if, in fact, they are contributing too much on the local level. But there's no doubt that we are asking our property taxpayers to pay too much. And that's why I say to those individuals that say the evidence-based model may be putting too much money into education, is until we get to adequacy, it's not enough. And until we get to a majority funding, it's not enough. And that's where this model moves us forward with a toolbox of 27 elements that not every district is currently using. But I think every district should look at and consider 
because the research-based evidence says those are the best practices that lead to student growth, that help the many needs that our students have today that students didn't have five or 10 years ago. Students today require a lot of support and services. Maybe that's not the role of education, but that's the time and place that we have to address some of those needs if we're going to change the outlook for a lot of our citizens and a lot of our communities across the state. So the evidence-based model is a model that we do support. Contrary to what you heard a moment ago, Republicans do support the evidence-based model. Not all. Some of them think the current formula is adequate. But there's a diversity of opinion across our state. But I would come back and say that the model that was introduced back in April, uh, Will uh, Davis had Senate Bill or uh, House Bill 2808, was a bill that I co-sponsored with him was a bill that capsuled the evidence-based model into legislation and did a lot of the practices and dealt with regionalization and tried to deal with the needs of special students, the needs of Chicago in special ways. I th had problems then and I had problems when we voted on it in the House. The fact that at the last hour we brought in some of the pension issues that have already been alluded to that need to be addressed through the pension code, not distorting our evidence-based model with those kinds of costs. I think if we can continue the discussion and come up with a new bill, we can reach consensus on these issues that support the needs of Chicago and the students in Chicago, that can deal with an adequate and equitable way of funding students across the state, and keep the focus on student growth, not necessarily district hold harmless. That was an, a key message in our governor's commission, is we wanted to focus on the student needs. And when you focus on district needs that are losing students, you're diverting resources that ought to be used through the formula to go to those students that need it around the state, not just to one or two or 10 or a dozen school districts. That's where holding harmless per student, dealing with the issues of the block grant are of critical importance to us Republicans as we try to negotiate a solution here. And the block grant was mentioned earlier. It was a formula that was created back in 1995 when the Chicago Public Schools had crisis at that time and the legislature gave the mayor and the city control over the school district and they gave them block grants so they didn't have to apply per student for various programs like every other school district in the state has to. That's what we call the block grant and that was to cut down costs perhaps, but to be an adequate representation of the student population in 1995. In 2017, we're at an entirely different student population for Chicago. And that's where we have $202 million that's in excess of what a per student uh, program would justify in the city. And that's why we've been focused on that issue. If we're going to put that as a base funding minimum in the hold harmless, then it should be adequate and accurate for the student population that Chicago has today. And, and that we use that money adequately around the state. So those are a couple of the differences that we have in how the model has been shaped in Senate Bill 1. But I think there are differences that can be resolved and we can very quickly get another bill that brings forth the evidence-based model and deals with some of these issues that we have on a political basis with the bill that we have today. And that is where we will have to leave it. Representative Pritchard, thank you so much. I did want to begin by just asking that question. As you move forward and look at the possibility of a compromise, I actually last evening had the opportunity to ask Governor Bruce Rauner, what do you need to be part of an education funding formula bill in order to sign on to it? And he said that there is nothing, no part of his mandatory veto that has to be included. So I have a twofold question there. First of all, do you believe the governor or is he just not showing his cards there? <laughs> and second of all, how about each of you? Could you go down the line and briefly express what has to be part of a measure in order for it to get your vote and frankly, for you to believe it will pass by your colleagues? And go ahead, whoever wants to be, we can just go right down the order. I'll leave it back to Barrickman, please. Sure, thanks, Amanda. Um, you know, I, I think, it, and I outlined in my, in my opening, some of the key issues 
I, I think the key issues, you know, it, it's hard to imagine how exactly everything gets resolved because uh, none of us are going to get everything that we, we want. I think some of the key issues need to be resolved. Those include um, how we handle Chicago's pensions, whether or not uh, Chicago, whether or not your view is that the state should pay those Chicago pensions, my belief strongly is that those pensions not be embedded to the school funding formula and that they ought to be placed in the pension code the way we deal with the state teacher retirement system pensions. There, the discussion at the commission about whether to have a conversation about pensions with school funding concluded with, I believe, strong beliefs by members of both parties that pension issues should be dealt with in the pension code and not in the school code. Because imagine what happens over time. As legislators and budgeteers are making budget decisions about what to fund for school funding, K through 12, we'll all have to know in the back of our head that some of that money really is going towards pensions. Now, around the state, some people think that we ought to call pensions and school funding, it's all one pile of money. But the reality is in Springfield, they're different. They're separate appropriations, and we, the legislature, makes decisions about how much money they want to spend on K through 12 schools, it's viewed as classrooms, mm -hmm. versus how much we spend on pensions. So if the state is going to pick up Chicago's pensions, I believe it should not be in the formula as it is in Senate Bill 1, it should be outside the formula. I think Democrats have uh, uh, agree with that. They privately say that that is good policy. The stakeholders who have chimed in along this debate have all said it look, it's better dealt with in the pension code. Why it's in Senate Bill 1, I presume, is a political decision. That's how we get votes. We make, we make sometimes illogical decisions in order to get votes. Senator so, Berkman, would you agree if there was a separate pension bill that funded Chicago pensions, will you say here in front of this audience that you would vote for it, for CPS pensions? So the, the change then becomes, the, cha the change then becomes, if we are going to place an obligation on Illinois taxpayers to make this additional cost, to incur this additional cost, how do we sell it to taxpayers? Now, I believe that a mechanism that can be used to sell it to taxpayers and to school districts is to give school districts the flexibility that CPS has to manage its personnel costs. Again, this is one of the benefits that exists under the law today, is that Chicago has the right to control some of its personnel costs in a manner that no other district does. So could there be a trade that could be sold to taxpayers? You're going to pay more for Chicago's pensions, but you're going to get more flexibility in your local school districts, which means you're going to drive down the local district costs and hopefully drive down property taxes. I think that's a, that's a discussion that negotiators have had. It's a discussion that we've all legislators have had, and I think that is a path to a solution on this. All right, so Representative Davis, could you go ahead and give your must, but if you also wanted to briefly explain why you believe it was that the pension provisions were inserted into the mix of the formula for Senate Bill 1 versus being dealt with separately. Well, certainly in the same manner in which we tried to support all other districts, Chicago had some specific asks as well. Um, and so we tried to accommodate those asks by way of Senate Bill 1, but certainly we didn't accommodate any of their asks at the expense of other districts. So we account for uh, a pension payment for the city of Chicago um, in the same manner that we, uh, well not the same manner, but in the manner in which the state is picking up pension costs for all others. So let me remind those of you who live in the city of Chicago, you pay for two pensions. You pay for the downstate teachers, and then you also pay for Chicago. Whereas for those of us who don't live in the city of Chicago, we pay only one, and that's for downstate teachers. And that's the cost that we have been picking up for a year. So this was an opportunity to create some parity, if you will, relative to how we uh, deal with um, situations um, in, in the city of Chicago. So in terms of, in terms of must-haves, I mean, I'm open to, to everything that we're talking about, but again, I'm not interested in hurting districts. And so far, some of the things that have been brought to the table may have a disparate impact on districts, and I can't understand why any of us would want to consider anything that has an impact, a negative impact, 
um, on, on districts. So to the extent in which um, some of the other items that have been brought into the conversation that weren't a part of SB1 from the very beginning, I mean, we're entertaining those conversations. We're entertaining those items. Um, I, I think there was several other items the senator could have put out there to say that are must-haves uh, in order to try to, to try to move forward on that. Um, but uh, yes, we are looking at a different way to deal with Chicago pensions. I mean, I think the concern was that is that sometimes when you kind of hitch the, the cars of the train together, it all moves together. But when you start putting cars on other tracks, it has the ability not to move. And I think that's kind of the, the, the challenge with any part uh, of this bill, is that when we start separating the pieces, the question is, does, the piece, does those other pieces move? If we're all moving, to, if it's all together, we can all move together and we can still get uh, the bill passed that funds adequately our schools, implements an evidence-based model, provides for Chicago's uh, uh, pension, pension costs as well, and uh, probably a, a host of other things. But again, it moves districts forward. And that's exactly what we are attempting to do or want to do uh, with the passage of SB1. Senator Menard and Representative Pritchard, are there any must-haves for you that you would like to quickly list off? So here's, here's my must-haves. Uh, we need a system that's adequately funded and that's equitably funded. I don't care how we get there. That's what we need. Um, I'm the only panelist here, by the way, who was not an original proponent of the evidence-based model, uh, which I think is evidence that uh, there's no pride of authorship, that if there's a proposal that produces a system that's adequately funded over time and equitably funded over time, that's something we should all support because that's the goal, adequacy and equity in public education, which in both metrics we score uh, at or near the bottom on any, any scale when comparing us to other states. So that's my must-haves, adequacy and equity. Um, other things that come to the table, if they don't deal with adequacy and equity, they should be dealt with separately. But Senate Bill 1 is a good proposal. It should be the law. It should be the law in the state of Illinois. It's battle tested. It's supported by educators across the state. It's good public policy. Uh, the idea that we're going to deal with uh, inequity in pension funding in Illinois somewhere else without having a discussion about school funding is just plain silly in my mind. There's all kinds of inequity in today's system. There's terrible inequity in today's system. There's special deals for different types of school districts all over the place. The difference between those and CPS pensions is they don't grab the headlines and they're not as visceral to voters in downstate Illinois. That's the only difference. Nobody's running around downstate saying, my gosh, we got to go after that PTEL adjustment, right? No one would care, would they? Here's the facts. The bill gives $221 million to CPS for its normal costs. We make an adjustment for its unfunded liability, which is the debt that CPS still has to pay. TRS gets a $4 billion payment with no debate, which is a $600 million increase over last fiscal year. That's what the bill does. That's not a bailout. That's parity. Along with that, we get a system that drives us toward adequacy and equity. And Representative Pritchard, briefly, please. Yeah. So that has been the battle cry since we started, adequacy and equity. But the, the dish issues are when we get down in the weeds, so to speak, about how we achieve adequacy and equity. And for me, as we look at what the governor did and the points that, I think that was your question, the points that we thought he was maybe hitting in the right direction, comes back to the discussion about per student focus and how we use the model, the question about looking at the block grant and bringing some fairness there to uh, a reimbursement that's not based by the number of students and the needs that the money was intended. I think the discussion the governor also raised about TIF districts, we mentioned PTEL, but TIF districts are another one and those are being gamed around the state so they can hide the amount of money that a school district is putting into education. We've got to look at TIF districts going forward to make sure that if the district is getting money from the TIF district, TIF district that that money is counted towards their local capacity target. That's something that the governor brought up again. I think you've got to look at how we give property tax relief and having a voter referendum for those districts that are over 110% of adequacy, for example. Giving voters a chance to say, 
let's lower our property taxes. The bill also has in it a tax swap, and that's another issue that hasn't been discussed very much at all. But that idea, again, could allow some property tax relief without taking local money away, but giving state funds to that area and bringing us more towards that adequacy that the Constitution requires. Now, uh, the governor's a mandatory veto, Senator Berkman, you said you didn't even know what was in it, and yet you have been really the leader for Republicans on this initiative for education funding reform. How is it that it was so very different from what we had been hearing from the governor in terms of a bailout, and what, what do you think of it? Is it possible to tackle, for example, something as complicated as TIFFs before schools open their doors? So, or maybe a weekend, uh, <laughs> the easy fun part of school where they're not taking tests yet. I, I think, look, you know, maybe you should have the governor here to answer that question. But, but what, I can, what I can say to the administrative veto, and, and this builds on, you know, what, what Representative Pritchard just outlined. There are some important provisions within that amendatory veto that have been debated. They're discussed in the negotiations and there are strong policy reasons for which we need to have a more thorough public discussion and hopefully both sides will give consideration. Consider, the, consider this. The amendatory veto removes some of the cost drivers. We haven't talked about that a lot, but um, this, the amendatory veto removes some of the cost drivers that are part and parcel to Senate Bill 1. The cost drivers that, ever, that year after year will drive up the costs of implementing an evidence-based model in the state of Illinois. Those cost drivers, they're called escalators and regionalization factors, those cost drivers have an, incredibly, an incredible role on tying the hands of future legislators from setting priorities in the budgeting process. In fact, what they do is tie their hands and limit legislators' ability to budget by saying that the law automatically makes increases year after year to the amount of money that goes into school funding. Now this is where this is interesting because if we were to look at the last 10 years of school funding in our state, what you see is that legislators, the General Assembly and the governor, whomever it is at the time, makes budgeting decisions. They set priorities. Over the last 10 years, some years, the legislature and the governor made decisions to cut school funding or to hold school funding flat. They did that presumably as a result of making other budget priorities. More recently, we've made decisions to increase the funding in, in school funding. So by removing these cost drivers from the formula, I think we're empowering legislators to do what they're supposed to do, which is represent people, the 13 million of the state, and make budgetary decisions on their behalf. Why tie next year's General Assembly? Why tie their hands? Why not allow them to do their job given whatever priorities exist in the state at next year's time? And I will, um, would love for one of the Democrats perhaps on the panel to respond to that briefly, including a question from somebody here in the lovely audience who says, opinions do not educate our students, quality education does. How do we ensure every student gets a quality education what does adequacy mean to you, and should education be the number one priority? So a lot there, but I think really distill it down to that. Should education be the number one priority, and is that what Senate Bill 1 in its original form says in terms of budget measures? Or guarantees the escalator issue that the, the Senator Barrickman was speaking The answer to. to your question is yes. <laughs> the end. <laughs> That's the answer. Um, I. I let me very, very briefly, and, and I will ask uh, the senator to, to chime in on this. Uh, the, this senator talked about uh, cost drivers, reason, uh, like regionalization. Well, one of the great things about regionalization is that it makes uh, a, a downstate district, which is generally not the wealthiest district, it gives them the opportunity to be competitive with teachers. Uh, there's a report that I've heard about today from uh, regional offices of education, how they are down 2,000 teachers, and they're losing teachers to the wealthier part of the state because they pay more. So when we talk about regionalization, that's there to try to make downstate districts more competitive so they can attract better teachers. You know, people are going to go where the money is. I think, think that's the nature of business. So why not have something in place 
that allows for teachers to make better decisions about where they go instead of always flocking to simply where the dollars appear to be. It gives them the opportunity uh, to do that. So that's why something like that is, is in the bill and why we think that uh, having that is, is a good thing. Um, uh, the hold harmless, and, and I, I, I got to say something about the hold harmless. So hold harmless means you don't hurt anybody. So to have a per pupil expenditure from the onset of this means that those districts that have experienced dr dr losses in their population are gonna get hurt immediately out the door by having that from the onset. So what we decided to do is to capture where everybody, every district is with the hold harmless and leave that district flat right where they are. And then the new dollars will be reflective of those different population shifts that our districts are experiencing. We hear about it all the time. We know that that's a reality. So it's important to characterize the hold harmless in the right way and not say that per pupil is the right way to go, particularly when from the onset, it could have a disparate impact uh, on a district. We want to have a hold harmless. That's the way we've operated in this vein ever since that I've been chair of the Appropriations Committee. We always start out by keeping districts flat and then we make adjustments uh, uh, in, uh, in different ways from there. So that, that's, that's extremely important as to, to point that out as this conversation moves forward. You know, I would like to um, have a question. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Representative Pritchard, a, a lot of attention has gone to the Republicans that split from the r governor in voting for a budget as well as for an income tax hike. You are one of those individuals. Also a lot of attention to representatives who may be freer to the thought would be vote one's conscience because they're not running for re-election due to retiring such as yourself. So can you say here, does that open you up at all to perhaps joining Democrats and voting for an override of Senate Bill 1 if it comes to that? So I've based my career on looking at the facts, judging policies based on how it affects citizens in my district and across the state. That's why I ended up voting for the budget. That's why I will continue to evaluate every piece of legislation, including SB 1. My decision is that we've skewed SB 1 from what will help every student and that we need to come back with a follow-up bill that will right those deviations and deliver on what we have been working for for a decade or more. So I think it's going to be difficult to pass any kind of SB1 version without coming back and addressing some of the other issues we've already talked about. And when we talk about funding per student or per district, today we are funding per student Districts are already used to adjustments from year to year. So moving forward doesn't change their expectations. And what it's doing is you're paying a district for students it doesn't help and doesn't have. And we ought to use that money elsewhere where it will do some good. So I'll take and that I think as a if no you're looking for an override. At the cost of living, as we were mentioning a moment ago on regionalization, is the cost of living is less downstate. That's why there's a regionalization factor that reduces some of their adequacy target. So Pritch Representative Pritchard, I, I'll take that as a no for voting for an override. I've said that several times. Just making sure, getting it out there clearly. All right. Something that I have not heard a uh, discussion of in talking about what needs to be part of this is an issue that has gained attention, and that is the notion of a uh, private school scholarship program supported by tax credits. Do you believe that that will be part of a compromise and how can the state afford something to the tune of $100 million at a time where we clearly have seen a budget of people for the past couple of years as well as talking about not having enough money perhaps to give schools escalators in years going forward? Who would like to take that up? I don't know who's selling it, but <laughs> so is there anybody here that for whom that is a top priority and how much is that a part of your negotiations? Sure, let me, let me take this. <laughs> Um, that here's, here's what's interesting. Uh, we've heard that the speaker has uh, made a commitment that a scholarship tax credit program will be part of a negotiated agreement for school funding reform. I believe that commitment's been made. He has not made that commitment to me, but I have heard that that commitment has been made. Now, there, there, are, there are varying views on this. To outline the program, the, the program is designed as a manner of a, allowing school children choices in the education that they receive. 
Children have varying needs. Some children attend schools where the school district is not providing the services that a child needs. Some children have very special needs that are met by other school choices that may exist that aren't available to those children in need. And so the idea is that a program could be set up funded by private contributions, donors, that those donations could then be used to pay for the tuition of school children and give school children more choices. Now, this type Briefly of- Briefly here, sorry, we're yeah, closely yeah. running out of That's time. I really, sorry. I'll conclude, there you go. <laughs> Just, do we think that that would be part of a compromise? Can I get a show of hands from the four of you? Is that necessary from it, your conversations? So no, it's all not, right. It's not um, necessary, no. But it was brought by the Republicans to the table as part of the, to cut the deal. And with that, I, um, we have to about finish up. I wanted to throw in, if anybody can get this in in their closing remarks, haha. <laughs> Lawrence Massal has a question in terms of why the legislature in the first place created a separate pension for Chicago teachers, so why not absorb that into the downstate pension system? If anybody would choose to take that up, I will give you 30 seconds each. Keep into it, fellas. So let's start with Representative Pritchard and go on down the line. So we have two pension oh, systems in Illinois because that was the agreement back in 1995. Chicago chose to keep a separate pension system. Yeah. If conditions change and it's time for the state to help share in that pension cost, fine. Then let's also open up all the other agreements that were made in 1995 and bring them to the table and allow all school districts to have the same benefits that CPS has dealing with personnel issues. And actually, so yes, go ahead, Senator so Menard. I, I would say that um, I think it's important to note here in this conversation that much of what uh, Governor Rauner has done over the last month, uh, especially in downstate, is going to prevent thoughtful conversations like that one, Mr. Massal, from moving forward. Um, I think the governor has been incredibly divisive. I think he has used that as a political tactic to stall uh, progress on school funding reform as part of a political calculus. One of the uh, outcomes of that are going to be, I think, lasting for many years to come uh, divisions when it comes to pension issues between Chicago and downstate. Um, I think it is what it is, unfortunately, but I think that's one of uh, the outcomes of what's happened in the past month, especially when uh, we try to write some of these things all over the school code, all over the pension code, especially the one dealing with pensions. Next, from Springfield, Governor Rauner speaks at the Republican Day rally at the State Fair. This runs about 15 minutes. I am so excited, I'm so honored to be here with you. We're at a historic time in our state. And I want to, I was coming here to say thank you to every one of you here. Thank you. Thank you for your patriotism. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your dedication. You're here because you love Illinois. You love the United States of America. And you want democracy restored in our state so we can have a better future for all our children and our grandchildren. Yeah. Together, together what we want is a government that actually works for the people. You know what? This next election, some people will say, well, this is about Democrats versus Republicans. And yeah, that's going to be part of the message. But you know what this is really about? This is about corrupt political insiders, the powerful political class inside government who are working against the people. So it's the political power against the people. And we're with the people as the reason we're going to win in 2018. It's going to be a brutal battle. You guys know this corrupt political class in Illinois, they've been entrenched for years and years. And they got their special interest groups, they got their patronage workers, they got their cronies, they got their buddies who make money from your hard-earned tax dollars. And they don't want to give up their power. But you know what? The people are mad. I travel the state of Illinois every day, and I love it. That's my favorite part of my job. I'm traveling from from down in Marion, up to Rockford, from Danville to, to over in Quincy. I'm everywhere in the state. And people come up to me dozens of times every day and they say, Governor, stay strong. Don't back down. Don't give in. Stay the course. We're on the right track. Mike Madigan's a problem and Mike Madigan's got to go. And, and a lot of those people 
people go on and say, and Governor, I'm a Democrat. I don't normally support Republicans, but I love what you're trying to do, and we're going to be with you this next cycle. This is a, this is a big this is a big deal. I got I to tell you, I got to tell you a little story. This is very emotional to me. This, you know, I'm a volunteer. I'm just doing this because I love Illinois. This is home. Home is worth fighting for. This is home. I was born in Illinois. I lived here my whole life. Raised six kids here. Built businesses here. I love Illinois. This is home. And I just got so frustrated, so upset to see what the Chicago political machine and Mike Bannon and his cronies were doing to us. I just couldn't take it anymore. And you know what? Back six, seven years ago, when I was being uh, asked to run for governor, I said, I'm not a politician. I've never run for office in my, in my life. Let's find somebody who's done it before. And I went to 17 men and women. I went to 17 men and women. I said, please, you run for governor. I'll work for you. I'll, I'll raise you money. I'll support you. I'll work for you for a dollar a year. Let's turn the state around. You know what every one of them said? Whoa. Too invasive, abusive, expensive. Not going to do it. And I said, wow, that makes me mad. Home is worth fighting for. we got to do this. And some of them said to me, you know what, Bruce? You should do what we're doing. Change your residency to Florida and get out while you can. And I said, that will not happen. I love Illinois, and I'm going to fight with everything I've got to give us a better future for our state. And I was, I was uh, traveling around uh, last year. I'll tell you a little, little quick story. I was in, I think I was in Rockford. I don't remember exactly, but I was in a little store, and a woman came up to me. She, she, an elderly woman. She was very petite. She couldn't get around real good. She, uh, she was older, but she shuffled up to me. And she grabbed me by my left arm, and she looked up at me, and she said, Governor, you're our last hope. Don't give up. And she started to tear up, and I started to tear up, and I gave her a hug, and I said, that's exactly why I want to run for governor. I want to work for you and your family so you have a better future in our state, and we will never give up. We will never give up. This is I'm so proud to be a Republican because our values as a Republican Party are the values that have made America the greatest nation on earth. That, that's a fact. Freedom, freedom and opportunity. We all came to America to get away from big government, to get away from tyranny, to, from, to get away from being told what, what we had to do and what we couldn't do. And we came here for freedom for our families. So we could have freedom of religion, freedom of speech, free enterprise, and free competition to build business and be entrepreneurs. We came to America for freedom, and the Republican Party is the party of freedom. This is you know what, if you read the, you read the founding documents, and I still like to read them occasionally to get inspired, Declaration of Independence and our founding documents. You know what, our founding documents, when you look at them, they don't tell people what they can't do. They don't restrict people. They, res they tell government what government can't do. That's, and that's, that's, that's what we need more of in the United States of America. And the Revolutionary War, you know what got that started? Fighting against taxes from a tyrannical government. And they said, no more taxes. You're not increasing our taxes. We're going to break away and run our own government that's got low taxes. And we are the party. We are the party of limited government and individual liberty, personal responsibility, and low taxes. That's what's built America, and that's why we're going to be the majority party again. And you know what? Everything that we're fighting for, the people of Illinois want. Our values are bipartisan. People in America, people in Illinois want more jobs. Everybody wants more jobs. Everybody wants to have a competitive, dynamic economy. And let me tell you, everybody in Illinois, Democrats and Republicans, are sick and tired of having their property taxes go through the roof and have the highest property taxes in America. And we're the ones fighting against high property taxes. We're going to bring down the property taxes in Illinois. And everyone in Illinois wants the best education for their children. Everyone in Illinois deserves a great education for their children, regardless of what their family income is, regardless of where they, where they live, regardless of their neighborhood. Every neighborhood needs a great school. 
We, as Republicans, fight to make sure we have school fairness and school equity, and we've got the best K-12 system in America, and that's what we're going to get with this new education funding formula. Now, this, is, this battle, this battle about the education funding formula right now just symbolizes everything that we're struggling about. Because you know what? We've had a broken education system in Illinois for decades. The Democrats, before I became governor, the Democrats cut school funding from the state four times in the prior 10 years. They played political football with our school funding. And the Democrats created the biggest gap between what low-income students receive per person, per student, and high-income kids. It's wrong, it's broken, and the Democrats denied the American dream to too many of our kids. And I said, as governor, I am not going to stand for that. We're going to get more money from the state into our K-12 system. And I want it equitably spread throughout the state, equally for the city and the suburbs and around the state of Illinois. And you know what? We had a be beginnings of a good bill drafted up, and I was excited about it. But you know what happened? Speaker Madigan and his cronies grabbed that bill, and they stuffed in a massive bailout massive special deal for the city of Chicago. They want to divert money from the classrooms and in the suburbs and here in central Illinois, in southern Illinois, in northwest Illinois, take money from the classrooms here and divert it to the financial disaster that's in the city of Chicago. And that is not fair, that is not right, and we're going to stand against it. And they're, and they're complaining. They say, oh, it's not fair. They say, uh, Governor, you hate Chicago. Are you discriminating against Chicago? No, I'm not. Not one little bit. I, I was born in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. My grandparents were dairy farmers in Wisconsin. I grew up in Lake County. I come from a proud farm family. But I work for everybody in Chicago, just like I work for everybody here in Springfield and everybody across the state. And we need to treat all the kids the same. No more special deals for any one particular district. What my inventory veto did was just take out the special deal for Chicago. That's all I did. Just take out the special deal for Chicago, and that freed up hundreds of millions of dollars that we're going to go to that broken financial structure, and we're going to go all through the funding formula to all the schools around the state. And you can go right online and look at the changes, illinois.gov slash gov. You can look up your district. We got millions of dollars more for Springfield, millions of dollars more for Decatur, and Danville, and Peoria, and Waukegan, and uh, Elgin, and Aurora. The money where it belongs for the kids who need it the most. This is what's fair, and this is what's right. Other districts, you know, Chicago likes to say, well, we got kids in poverty, they need more money. Well, there are kids in poverty, and it breaks my heart. I've tried to help the kids in poverty in Chicago my whole life. But you know what? There's kids in poverty in Springfield. There's kids in poverty in Elgin and Aurora and Rockford and Waukegan. They deserve to be supported too. And I work for all the children. But you know what? In Elgin and Rockford and Aurora, they don't have what Chicago has, huge property tax wealth in office buildings downtown. No other community in Illinois has that. And what does Chicago choose to do? Chicago politicians choose to do? Put massive TIF districts on their buildings take those away from funding their schools, and then create slush funds for their mayor to, to dole out special deals. Slush funds rather than funding the schools. And then they force us to subsidize that, and that is wrong. We are not going to let that happen. And you know what? You know what Elgin and Rockford and, and Joaquin and Aurora also don't have? They don't also have a guy named Mike Madigan, who has a business downtown Chicago that makes him a millionaire, a millionaire by reducing the property taxes on office buildings downtown in special tax deals where he gets a cut of the action and he takes away the tax revenue from those buildings that could be funded the schools. It just makes him and his cronies rich. That we got to stop. That's a conflict of interest for the people of Illinois. change in our system. We as Republicans stand for more jobs and a booming economy. We stand for lower taxes, especially lower property taxes to efficient government. We stand for better schools that are equitably funded, that are fair for all of our kids. And we stand for political reform so we can restore democracy in the state of Illinois through term limits and fair maps so we can have competitive general elections again. 
and together, together we're going to get this done. And I'm excited. I'm so excited, I can't tell you. we got 15 months to go. 15 months to go. Big election coming up. We need all your help. We need everybody to turn out. You know what? And I'm, and I'm working 24-7. You know, I started this job, I was 6'8 and had a full head of hair. This is really, this is hard. This is hard. But the reason I'm pumped up, the reason I got so much energy, is for me, this is simply a labor of love. I love Illinois. I love the people of Illinois. And it's a privilege and it's a humbling opportunity for me to work for you and every one of our families in this great state. And we, I'm going to work my tail off. And you know what? I'm gonna, we are going to win re-election for the governorship because we stand for what's right and we're going to get bipartisan support. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to fight hard to re-elect our members of Congress and we're going to fight doubly hard in the General Assembly right here in the Capitol. We are going to pick up seats in the Senate and the House. We're going to pick up seats in the Senate and the House. And here's the key. In the House of Representatives, we pick up nine seats next year, totally doable, nine seats. Mike Madigan is no longer speaker in the General Assembly. And you know why, you know why that's going to happen? You know why we're going to pick up at least nine seats, maybe a dozen seats? Because Democrats, just as much as Republicans, are angry. They know the system's broken. They know Mike Madigan has set up a machine that makes him rich and his cronies rich, but takes away jobs and raises taxes and defunds the schools. They know it, and they support it. That's why term limits are just about as pos uh, supported by Democrats as by Republicans in the state of Illinois. And, you know, Madigan's been able to keep his power with his caucus because he says, go ahead in central Illinois, southern Illinois, tell them that you hate me. T say that you're, you're going to run as a Democrat. Say that you don't support Mike Madigan. You, you don't like the Chicago machine. Go ahead and say. You can, don't tell them the truth. And so we've got, we've got Democrat caucus members here in central Illinois, southern Illinois, northwest Illinois, who say the Chicago machine's terrible. Mike Madigan is self-dealing and he's a crook. Whatever. They say that. And then every year they vote for him to be speaker. Every year. They, they deny it, but you know what? We are going to expose the truth in this election cycle, and the people of Illinois are going to know the truth. They vote for him to be speaker every year, and they vote the way he tells them to vote. So they really work for the Chicago machine and his wealth, rather than for the, the citizens in their own districts. And we are going to expose that. We're going to make sure the people of Illinois know that their Democrat caucus members work for Madigan that doesn't work for the people. And we're going to get them out of office and hold them accountable for that. That's why this time, this time, we're going to win a historic victory. We're going to have the truth come out. The truth is on the side of what's right and what's just. The truth is on the side of our Republican Party, but the truth is on the side of all the people of Illinois. And all of us need to call on our neighbors and our friends, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, stand together. Together we can ignite a revolution of the people against a broken political system in Illinois. We can get out the insiders and those corrupt politicians who've been making their money off of the hardworking taxpayers of this state, who've been making money by taking money away from our teachers and our schools, who've been making money by locked in power for decades. Get them out and restore democracy in Illinois and power back to the people so we can have a better future. This is an exciting election, everybody. We're going to win on the victory in 2018. Let's restore democracy in the state of Illinois. Thank you now. A better future for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much. God bless everybody. Appreciate you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. The Illinois Channel salutes our advisory council members, leaders in business, education, law, medicine, and other fields from across Illinois. I'm Mark Beale, Executive Director of the Chemical Industry Council of Illinois. We represent over 220 companies, employing almost 46,000 people at over 700 facilities located across Illinois. These are the kind of jobs any state would wish to have. 
with an average annual wage of over $81,000 per year. To keep these kind of quality jobs in Illinois means we need to keep a competitive business climate with other states. Our tax rates, regulations, transportation infrastructure, the quality and education of our workers, these factors all combine to create a climate that's going to attract new businesses or in some cases keep them away. That's why the Chemical Industry Council of Illinois supports the work of the Illinois Channel. They bring us into the Capitol to hear debate on such issues as reforming the workers' compensation system, health care reform, and the debate over changing the state's pensions. These are among the issues covered by the Illinois Channel that affect all of us. Taken together, they create a business climate that will keep the Illinois economy growing or cause it to slip into further decline. That's why we all need to know what's happening on policy issues affecting our state and our communities. That's why I watch the Illinois Channel, and I hope you do too. The Illinois Channel, it works for all of us. Next, from Springfield, several Democrat candidates for governor, including State Senator Daniel Biss and businessman J.B. Pritzker, discuss their platform and why they're running. This runs about 30 minutes. Look at this room. This is an unbelievable. Good morning, everybody. Guys, the, governor man the governor's mansion's far away. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. I think he heard you. I'm Daniel Biss. I'm state senator from the 9th District. I'm running for governor of Illinois. It is such a joy to be here. This room of beautiful activist Democrats is an extraordinary thing. Thank you, Doug House, for the remarkable work you have done to make this happen. Thank you for honoring my two great friends, Lauren Beth Gash from the 10th Congressional, Bill Houlihan. I don't know how they've accomplished so much that they were honored for because they spent so much time giving me advice. I thought that was their full-time job. They are unbelievable Democrats who have lifted our party. And there are a ton of public officials here. I don't want to go too far down the list, but I cannot uh, avoid honoring and thanking my great friend, Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Thank you, Robin, for your endorsement of this campaign for governor. Thank you for your incredible work, not just for the second congressional district, but for the entire country. I think back a lot to the night of November 8th when all the meetings and the victory parties that weren't were over, and I went home. And I went upstairs into the bedroom of my two children. They were six and eight years old, asleep in their two beds next to each other, peaceful, beautiful. And I thought about the future that it looks like we might be creating for them, and I just started to cry. The next morning, I wasn't any less sad. I wasn't any less upset. I wasn't any less frightened, but I woke up ready to fight. And the great news is that across the state of Illinois and across this country, people woke up ready to fight. I cannot tell you in the course of the first months of this race for governor, as I have crisscrossed this state, the activist energy the passion, the intensity. And it's not just in the most liberal parts of the state of Illinois, it's in places where Trump did well. It's the living room in Macoupin County. It's the new activist women marching for Planned Parenthood in McLean County. It's people across, shout out to McLean County. It is the people across this state who figured out on November 8th, not just that we made a mistake, it's the people who figured out that nobody else is come, gonna come in and fix it for us. We have to come together and rise up and take control of our state and solve these problems for ourselves. Now, now, the last week has been kind of rough. The last week has been kind of rough. I didn't think it was supposed to be controversial to condemn neo-Nazis. I didn't think it was supposed to be controversial to condemn white supremacists. I didn't think that was going to be something that you had to take a poll to figure out what the right thing to do was. I didn't think it was something that you could flip-flop back and forth and back and forth again as our president has, or flip-flop only maybe once as our governor has. But that's what we're dealing with, and that's what all of us are here to fight against. That's what brought us all into this battle. But I want you all to understand, 
that if we're going to learn the most important lessons that got us to this dangerous moment, we got to remember that as Democrats, we have to be about more than just saying what's wrong with the other side. We have to talk about our own vision for how we can lift people up. We have to talk about our own vision for how we can solve the state's problems. We have to talk about what it takes to fix a tax system where millionaires and billionaires get away for decades without paying their share and the rest of us can't afford schools that work as a result. We have to talk about how our solutions are going to lift people up. And guess what, most importantly? In this dangerous, difficult moment, in this time as we wonder, good Lord, how do we get to be in a situation where we've got a Republican president of, I don't even know what to say, we've got ourselves a Republican House of Representatives and a Republican U.S. Senate, we've got ourselves a Republican governor here in Illinois, Republicans have so much control over the federal judiciary, state legislatures and governors across the, st the country. Let's be honest, we're in trouble. And that's an opportunity for us to decide who we're going to be. When we come back, as we rise up, what kind of Democratic Party are we going to be to rise up? Are we going to be a billionaire party or are we going to be a middle class party? Are we going to be a corporate party or are we going to be a people's party? Are we going to have ourselves an election or are we going to hold an auction? Democrats, this is a moment of unique opportunity. This is a moment for an aggressive, progressive, aspirational agenda. This is a moment to bring control back for the rest of us. This is a moment to say, hey, listen, Illinois government hasn't worked for the rest of us for way too long because of who pays for the elections, because of the way the political system works. Illinois government has had a tax code written by the rich for the rich and a school funding system that leaves the rest of us out. This is a moment to solve those problems. And listen, here is what I find so exciting and energizing about this. If we get this right, it's about so much more than just saying no to somebody else. It's about solving problems that we have been enduring for decades, that we've known what the solutions were, but we just didn't have the political infrastructure in place to get it done. With 1,800 people in this room, we have what it takes to get it done. With people rising up in every corner of the state of Illinois, we have what it takes to get it done. With a progressive movement rising across our nation, we have what it takes to get it done. And if we get this right, we're going to look back on this moment years from now, and yes, we'll say what took so long, but we'll also thank ourselves for the work we put in. We'll thank ourselves for rising to the moment. We'll thank ourselves for understanding what's at stake. We will thank ourselves for transforming our state in a way that results in not people leaving Illinois, but people flocking in. Not a middle class shrinking, but a middle class growing. Not wages stagnating, but wages rising to $15 an hour and beyond. Not a lack of opportunity in some corners of the state that state government has too often looked away from, but economic opportunity thriving in every single neighborhood of the state of Illinois because we will invest in every corner of the state of Illinois because we believe in every person in the state of Illinois. That is what's at stake at this moment. This is what we can accomplish. I'm Daniel Biss. I'm running for governor because it's time to take our state back and build a government that works for the rest of us. Thank you, and God bless each and every one of you. Please join me in welcoming candidate for governor, Chris Kennedy. Thank you all. Thank you. At, at the end of this primary contest, at the end of the primary contest, we will all stand united as Democrats against a common opponent. And even as we battle each other from now to March, there will be moments, moments like Charlottesville, Virginia, where we'll We'll pause for a moment and we'll stand not just as Democrats, but much more importantly, we'll stand together as Americans. When President Abraham Lincoln was killed, Walt Whitman wrote a poem. It was called Captain, My Captain. It begins, O oh, Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every wreck. The prize we sought is won. 
Whitman's poem, it was a metaphor for Lincoln's life, and most importantly, his death, which comes right as, about, as he is about to achieve victory on the battlefields during the Civil War. No matter where you grew up, we were taught at an early age to revere the life of President Abraham Lincoln because he gave his life to the cause he thought was more important than any other, which was to hold us all together in a single union and in so doing, give us all greater freedom. That poem by Walt Whitman, that was part of what we learned. It helped set the tone for our reverence for Abraham Lincoln. It helped set the tone so we understood Abraham Lincoln's life set the tone for the reverence that we should have for the country we are all lucky enough to be part of. Where is that tone today? Where is that reverence today? In Charlottesville, Virginia, the people there, among themselves, collectively they decide to take down a statue of Robert E. Lee, and outsiders come in, white supremacists, neo-Nazis, they come in to intimidate, in essence, to terrorize those people into changing their mind. A young woman is killed, two police officers are killed and trying to keep calm in the community they love. What does the President of the United States do? Does he go there to provide comfort to the grieving families? No, he retreats to New York City to his condo atop Trump Tower and he gives a press conference. He provides no comfort to those grieving families. Instead, he provides comfort and encouragement to the extremists and the domestic terrorists in our country. And then he has the nerve to ask, well, where does it end? We take down one statue, where does it end? I'll tell you where it ends. When we have a time of moral upheaval in our country and there's no moral leadership from the president. When we have a time of civil unrest and there's no civility coming from our president. Mr. Trump, it does not end in Charlottesville, Virginia. It ends close to that, northern Virginia, on the banks of the Potomac River, where I've spent countless hours on my knees as a small child, looking up into Robert E. Lee's home, kneeling at the grave of my father, kneeling at the grave of President Kennedy, looking up that hill and seeing Robert E. Lee's home there, which as many of you know is now Arlington National Cemetery. At the end of that poem, Whitman says, he says, my captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. He does not feel my arm. He has no pulse or will. Today it seems that in these current issues in Charlottesville and elsewhere, we have a president whose pale lips are still and what's worse, he lacks heart and he lacks will. Today in this country, now, more than anything else, we need to feel the steady heartbeat of a heart filled with compassion and feel the will that makes that compassion the heart of our nation. Thank you all very much. Please join me in welcoming candidate for governor, J.B. Pritzker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, fellow Democrats. All right, come on, one more time. You did it for Senator Biss. How about good morning? I love it. First, thank you very much to President Doug House for everything that you've done to help build this party. Give him a big round of applause. And to all our Democratic chairmen all across this great state of ours who are daily putting together the infrastructure of this party. And congratulations to my good friends, Bill Houlihan and Lauren Beth Gash on your awards today. Unbelievably great work grassroots, day-to-day, -day, knocking on doors. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I want to take this opportunity to introduce my lovely bride and my partner in this endeavor, M.K. Pritzker. Now, 
I know that failing to acknowledge one's spouse is a cardinal sin. Last week, I was very proud to announce maybe the most important decision of this campaign was made, and that was choosing my lieutenant governor running mate, State Representative Juliana Stratton. Juliana is not only a graduate of the I Will program that Loretta Durbin uh, founded, but, but also is a tireless campaigner and a passionate advocate for Illinois' children. And as Lieutenant Governor, Juliana will be a champion for working families all across this state. Now, this past Saturday, Juliana and I spent the morning at one of the most joyful events that you can one of the most joyful events of the year, and that was the Bud Billiken Parade. Yep. And in the afternoon, we watched in horror the events of Charlottesville unfold. Along with the nation, we cringed at Donald Trump's failure to call out the perpetrators as racists and neo-Nazis and white supremacists. I thought about how just the night before, Bruce Rauner went on Fox News and when asked point blank whether President Trump was doing a good job, he was afraid to utter a negative word. Well, I'm not afraid. Donald Trump is a racist and a bigot and a xenophobe and a liar. And Bruce Rauner's silence is deafening. This is what we're fighting against. This general election against Bruce Rauner isn't going to be an easy one. You know we've got a fight ahead. Are you ready for the fight? No, I mean, are you ready for a fight? Well, if we're going to beat back their lies, we can't let their rhetoric set the tone of our Democratic primary. We cannot adopt their warped sense of reality. I look around this room and I see good people. I see patriots. I see humanitarians and seekers of justice. If we stand together, if we stand together against Bruce Rauner, we will win. Because working families across Illinois know that Governor Rauner is destroying our state, causing the most damage to them, to working families. It's time to put Springfield back on the side of working families, isn't it? I am proud to have the support of the Illinois statewide AFL-CIO and 17 individual labor unions and community leaders across Illinois from Cook County to Cairo. But let's be clear, I'm working hard to earn the vote of every single labor household every voter in every county to build our party up so that we can win at every level. Are you with me? I'm a proud Democrat who spent decades fighting for social and economic justice to expand early childhood education, to create jobs and economic opportunity, to preserve a woman's right to choose. And by the way, Governor Rauner, sign HB 40. I led the building of the Illinois Holocaust Museum that teaches over 50,000 students every year to fight bigotry and hatred. And thousands of teachers attend that museum to learn those lessons and take it back to their classrooms all across the state. I invite all of you to visit. During my work building that museum, I came to know a Holocaust survivor named Elie Wiesel, whose words should guide us today and frankly should guide us every day. He said, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. There may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. We must always take sides, he said. We must always take sides. Words that take on an even more powerful meaning this week. 
as we look to the fight and resistance ahead. It's important that we Democrats remember that we are all on one side, the same side, the right side, together. So I ask you once again, will you stand together? Are you ready for the fight? Join me, thank you very much. At this time, the Illinois Democratic County Chairman's Association would like to recognize former Governor Patrick Quinn, who was in attendance today. Thank you, Governor Quinn, for all you have done. Please join me in welcoming Regional Superintendent of Schools and candidate for Governor, Bob Diver. Good morning, and let me begin by thanking all you county chairmen who have been so gracious to me as I've traveled the state, meeting you, visiting your county organizations. Some 20,000 miles of our campaign trail has led us to meet many of you through our tremendous grassroots effort. So I want, I want to thank you, and I want to thank my wife, Karen, who accompanies me today, who told me when I got into this race, she said, I don't want to see you at home. She said, you cannot win in the kitchen. So we are out meeting you. And I want to tell you this about this campaign trail, that Karen and I have been married 25 years, but she's campaigned with me 26, and that says something about a wife. So I, I just really appreciate her, her strong support. But I want to tell you this, for 38 years, I've done what's been talked about today in public education, as I've served students in the state of Illinois in many capacities, 28 years as a classroom teacher, teaching many kids that others didn't want to teach, teaching them skills, technical skills, as a career technical teacher. I served as the president of a local union. I've bargained contracts as a union president. I know the importance of that. And I'm proud of the very fact that during those 28 years, 22 of them I served in local government at all levels, from city council to being a township supervisor, two terms on a county board, one in a 62% Republican district which I was very, very proud of doing. And then serving countywide as a countywide elected official as regional superintendent the last 10 years. But I want to tell you specifically why I got into this race. I'm a downstater, as Dick Durbin was, okay? And I believe that someone from downstate, as Glenn Bouchard pursued this 20 years ago, should be your next governor to connect all of Illinois, to be that conduit from the south to Chicago, that brings back those fall-off Democrats that elected Bruce Rauner. You know, you need a candidate that's going to get farmers to vote for the next, the next governor to be a Democrat. You need teachers who fell off that are going to come across and vote for their next governor candidate. And you need those labor guys that voted for Donald Trump to come back home. And Bob Diver wants to bring them back. He wants to bring all those people back to the Democratic Party. Thank you. You know, you know, as Democrats, I think Bill Houlihan said it the best. We have to have our sight on that bullseye on Bruce Rauner. And I want to tell you, the Diver campaign has got that crosshair perfect. We're ready to do it. We're ready to take him out. We're ready for you to help us. We're ready for a grassroots effort throughout the state of Illinois that starts in each county, like the one I hail from, Madison County. And all those Madison County guys who are here know how to get out to vote. And thank you. So, so with that said, I encourage you to follow our campaign. Our campaign is very grassroots as we continue to tour the state, meet you, and reach out to you for your support. Thank you very much for the time. God bless you. God bless the Democratic Party. Please join me in welcoming state representative and candidate for governor, Scott Drury. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. I want to start by bringing us back to a, a point in time that we probably all want to forget. Uh, the morning, well, this will be the time that we want to remember, but then we'll go. The morning of November 8th, 
And I want you to think about how great you felt, how we all felt when we woke up the morning of November 8th because this was going to be the day. This was going to be the day that we were going to have the first female president in the history of the United States of America. And take yourself through that day and waking up on November 9th. And I want you to think about how you felt that morning. Do we ever want to feel that way again? Do we ever want to feel like we felt on November 9th of 2016? No. So what do we need to do? We need to look at what happened as our country and our state is spiraling out of control. The public is yearning for an experienced leader it can trust. Because if Donald Trump and Bruce Rauner and their failures have taught us anything, and it's a big if, it has taught us that experience matters and trust matters. We have a president who does not know what the word truth means. He cannot utter a truthful word other than to tell you he's telling the truth. We have a governor who ran a campaign on, I don't have a social agenda. I don't have a social agenda at all. But when we pass bills that he says he was going to sign, what does he do? He changes his mind. When he agrees with 90% of, of a bill that's going to fund education, what does he do? He says, I'm going to veto it. Illinois yearns for a leader with experience, a leader it can trust. My name is Scott Drury. I'm a former federal prosecutor. I'm a third-term state representative. And I'm running for governor to bring honest change to the state of Illinois and return Illinois to its rightful owners, the people of this great state. <laughs> Let's face it. It is not enough anymore just to say you're going to do something. right? We've heard a lot of speeches today, and, and they're all good, but any one of us could have read anyone, anyone else's speech, right? I could give my speech to somebody, and Senator Biss can give his speech to someone, and Mr. Prisker can give his speech to someone, and what are those? Those are words on paper. They don't mean anything. And the public knows it. After just a few months of Donald Trump, we know that words aren't enough. What have people done? What is their track record? I proudly represented the United States of America for over seven years, fighting for justice, fighting the battle of public corruption on the front grounds, the front lines of the battle of public corruption. I stood before juries and I said, this is the right thing to do. This is justice. As a state representative, I've taken on the issue of criminal justice reform. Before it was popular when people said, no, you can't fight for criminal justice. It's the wrong thing to do. And I said, no, it can never be wrong to do what's right. It could never be wrong to do what's right. And we passed those reforms and it didn't require it didn't require seeing a video of a young African-American male getting shot in the back 16 times for me to step up and say, this is wrong. And that's what Illinois needs. Illinois needs a leader who is going to lead from the front, not follow from behind, who's going to see an issue and take it on before it's popular, 